Welcome, welcome. This is the Enlightenment Show, and I'm your host, Laurie Schoenfeld. This is where Chicken Soup for the Soul meets the artist way with Nancy Drew. Our guest today is Jared Kwan, author and community leader. We're going to be chatting with him today all about his passion within the arts and how connecting and communicating bring people together. Welcome, Jared. So thrilled to have you joining us today. Oh, no, I'm super excited. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. What is your favorite thing about September, Jared? Well, uh, at least this September, man, that's so hard to say. So <laughs> my favorite thing about this September happens to be um, Salt Lake Fanex. I get to be a special guest over at Fanex. And so I really love that in particular. Mm -hmm. High five. I'm going <laughs> to see you there. It's so fun to be at Fanex. You and I met, I want to say, like seven, eight years ago at a League of Utah Writers conference meeting. And I've been so impressed with you because at, from that very point, I've watched you stretch out your hands and volunteer in multiple corners. Uh, within the arts, but also outside of the arts as well. Can you share with our listeners and viewers what different positions uh, you have led and been a part of? Yeah, wow, there's a lot. Uh, so I've been a part, I've been really fortunate to be on arts councils for West Jordan and South Jordan and the Eagle Mountain Arts Alliance in, in various capacities. Uh, in West Jordan, I was the chair at one point, which was a lot of fun. Uh, over in that arts council. I had, of course, I had been a, a vice chapter president of a chapter of the League of Utah Writers. I've been president of the League of Utah Writers. Now I'm currently serve as historian outreach for the League of Utah Writers, but I also am on the board for LTUE, uh, Story Makers, Teen Author Boot Camp, uh, and TEDx Salt Lake City. And I've also been a part of many other little conferences and events. I really hate, I'm, I'm sure I left out probably like six or seven different uh, positions or organizations that I've been a part of over that many years. Mm -hmm. What was the first position that started this whole thing of you being involved in the community? So it was, uh, it was two positions that happened to be almost the exact same time. So after a wonderful conversation with my wife, where we kind of, uh, Decided to set some new goals. Uh, I really wanted to make more difference in the community. And uh, and she was very supportive. The kids were really excited about that. Uh, and, and so what I did is I was trying to figure out how. <laughs> how do I how do I connect with people? How do I get things going? So I, at the time, had worked with uh, the daughter of the mayor of West Jordan. And I asked her, I'm like, hey, what do you care if I email your dad? And she goes, I don't care. <laughs> and, and he just said, hey, try the Arts Council. So I had actually emailed the West Jordan Arts Council and said, hey, I would just love to volunteer or help out, you know, in any capacity. And when I came to one of their meetings, they made me the second assistant chair of the literary arts, which is actually that person who sits in the back of the room and nods their head and says yes and, and sets up chairs at events. Uh, but I was happy to do so. And then immediately preceding that, I was fortunate enough to be on a panel at Salt Lake Comic Con. And on that panel, I uh, had amazing people, Dan Wells, uh, Larry Korea, Johnny Worthen, um, Dan Willis, um, and I'm missing somebody super, Natalie Whipple. Yeah, I love Natalie. And, and after that panel, Johnny Worthen turned to me and said, hey, have you ever heard of the League of Utah Writers? And I said, I had not. He goes, just check it out. He goes, I think you'll really like it. And it's funny because the very next day at Comic-Con, I was sitting off to the side preparing my notes for the next class. And Johnny was probably 50 yards away. And anybody who meets Johnny knows, has similar experiences. He shouts my name from about 50 yards away, Jared! And this is before the conference opens, so I can hear him. And he comes racing over to me and puts his arm around me and says, hey, what's your next panel? Let's go through this, you know. Um and he, he gave me some advice because he was a veteran of panels and I was newer to panels. 
And after that, I'm like, man, if this is the League of Utah Riders, like I have to be a part of that. And I, my very first meeting, I show up. Nobody knows who I am. I have no idea who anybody is. I, I joined as a, as a chapter member. And um, in that instance, it happened to be where where uh, you had to step down for, for health reasons. And Eliza Crosby get, gets up to announce that she's going to be president, needs a new vice president. And I said, well, good luck with that. I really hope whoever the new vice chair uh, of the chapter is has a great time. I'm like, that's not going to be me. <laughs> and so I, so I texted my wife and I said, Hey, the chapter has a position open, but I'm on the arts council now, you know, we're, I'm really busy, right? I've got lots going on. And she texted back and said, you said that you wanted to be more involved in the community. You know, how often is this going to come around? I'm like, yeah, you're right. So I did, I did legitimately the bare minimum. I emailed Eliza, my LinkedIn link and just said hey if nobody else volunteers you know i would be happy to volunteer and as soon as the meeting ends she comes running across the room and she's screaming hey you're the new vice president of the chapter i'm like you don't even know who i am <laughs> i'm like uh i could be a, a serial killer and she goes we're writers we're all serial killers here and uh, <laughs> and, and um those those coinciding events, which just stacked literally just within weeks of each other is what kicked off everything moving forward. And it's funny because just one of those events would not have triggered what ended up happening. It needed all of those pieces to fall into place for things to move forward the way they did. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna shout out to Eliza really quick. Love you, Eliza. Um, I loved that visual that you just gave, Jared, because I can see Eliza with her hands flying towards you. She has that just contagious excitement. So, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I love what you said, Jared, of how every single thing led up to the next. And it was like a, a foundation of building your own foundation of stepping into one thing, which opened up the door to lead to something else that once you said yes to that something else, there was another door that opened up, like building your own empire and building within the arts community. What was that passion that first got you saying, I want to be more involved in my community? Yeah, so for for many years, like I've, I've loved volunteering and being in the community and doing things uh, and events for the community. But it, it really, like something really sparked in me. I had published my book, Changing Wax, and I was at the previous Comic-Con uh, before the one I was on the panel with Johnny, and I was just a regular vendor. I'm sitting on the floor. I'm, like, talking with everybody else. I, I was at a booth with some amazing authors, uh, Joe Schneider, J.C. Thompson. Um, and the number one question I got from people was, uh, how did you get published? How did you accomplish this? How did you get to here? Because they legitimately did, weren't sure. And and yeah, they had the internet, but the internet can be kind of vague sometimes or too much, or too overwhelming. And and when I, you know, left that Comic-Con and I just had over that whole year, I just had this wonderful discussion with my wife. I'm just like, "What? What can I do? How can I go about this? Like what what does an opportunity even look like?" And it wasn't until I got to that point where I was like, okay, we had, we had just set our goals. Let's let's do some some really neat accomplishments. And then everything sparked. Mm -hmm. When you were stepping into these positions that you were saying yes to, what were some of the struggles and fears that you were also experiencing within that space? Yeah, 100% terrified. <laughs> I, I, I legitimately did not know what I was really getting into. I didn't know what the next step or layer really looked like. This was the first time I had, you know, seriously put myself into positions of unknown waters, uh, especially the vice chapter, uh, the vice chapter president, because I'd only attended one chapter meeting. <laughs> I, didn't, I had... I had no idea what they even did. I was like, did I overcommit myself on accident? The second assistant 
to the literary chair seemed pretty safe. So that one wasn't as terrifying. There was more like a, I can I could be safe sitting in the back of the room and nodding my head. Yes. Um, but still, it was a little nerve wracking because I had to talk to the Arts Council first before they would invite me to be on the Arts Council. And so they kind of interviewed me to see why I wanted to be there, you know, what I had done before. And that was, I felt like I was interviewing for a job. I'm like, uh, <laughs> so nervous, so nervous, but, you know, super rewarding. Mm -hmm. What advice would you give authors who are looking to stretch themselves in their community with feeling that fear and stepping in anyways? Yeah. You know, the best advice that I can give to people is to just throw yourself into that work, much like you do when you're, with your writing. When you're writing in the middle of a project, you know, it's not bad. It's not terrible. You know, when you very first start out a project, it can seem a little daunting, depending on what project you're working on. And then you get into it. You, you really throw yourself into it because there's passion there. If you pick a volunteer opportunity or, or an opportunity to stretch yourself, and you throw yourself into it, much like you do your work, it, it takes care of itself. The fear works itself out. And one of the neat things is, and what I've learned is that, you know, as it turns out, everybody else is human. They're not robots. If, <laughs> if you're struggling or you're curious or you're, or you're worried about something, if you communicate with people, they're there to help you. They want to make sure you're not overstressed. They want to make sure you're not burning out. They want to make sure, you know, you're, uh, things are appropriate for your, your position. Mm -hmm. In what ways do you personally think that connecting and communicating helps bring people together? Yeah, boy, as it turns out, people, um, are, they're kind of afraid of what their, their branding or their ego or, or how they can come across if they ask for help or if they, ask somebody else if they want help, right? And the key there is what I've discovered, especially running across all the organizations that I'm on, is there's individuals that I found that are so afraid to ask for help that they'll do one of two things. Either they'll just keep saying, oh, no, I'm on top of it, but never are, or they disappear. Like they just go <laughs> silent, and uh, which is not helpful to anybody. And then it leaves that organization in a lurch. But 100% of the time, whenever somebody's like, hey, I really need help with this, or hey, you know, I'm really busy, or I have this life challenge, you know, can, can I get some help, or what do you think? And then other people are able to jump in, take on that task, that person makes it through it, and everybody grows from that experience, both mm -hmm. uh, personally and professionally together. It really inspires a lot. A hundred percent. Asking for help really is such an interesting human experience of like, we all have moments where we need help, but we all have our ego that is terrified to ask for help. <laughs> for sure. Yeah. It could, it could be really tough and I yeah. totally get it. Yeah. What would you say, Jared, out of all the experiences and communities that you've worked with so far, what are some of your favorite experiences that have really just held with your heart? Yeah, this is a great one. And I was happy to share this just recently, actually. Uh, so my last year as president of the League of Utah Writers, I was over the Quills Conference, uh, which is you know amazing event in the fall. It just, just barely happened this year. But I was there, and we had uh, the previous Utah Poet Laureate, Lance Larson. The, who had been the top poet in Utah for th three years, professor at BYU. And after the awards banquet, I was coming out of the room. Everybody's coming out of the, uh, out of the, uh, the banquet hall. And Lance stops me. He goes, hey, Jared, come here for a second. I'm like, okay. So I come walking over. And in there he's standing with a, um, a woman and her, her teenage child. And, and Lance says, hey, did you know that she, that she was the one who had won the scholarship to come to the Quills Conference? And I said, yeah, I was really excited that she was able to win the, the, the contest. We were able to get her here, and, and her mom was able to join her. I'm like, this was a, a big deal. He goes, he goes, yeah, you don't understand. He goes, this teenager is one of the most prolific write, uh, poets I've ever met. 
And this is coming from the top poet in Utah. And like uh, in that moment, like I nearly cried. <laughs> like I was like, oh my gosh. I mean, I could not express my gratitude for him to share that with me, but to know that I helped create the scenario where those two could end up in the same place, share that experience. And forever, that teenager and, and her parent were forever changed and altered their course because I was able to do some extra volunteer work in the community. Mm -hmm. I love that. <laughs> I'm just soaking in that moment too of just knowing that you had a part in that experience and being able to witness that is such a cool thing. So powerful. Mm -hmm. How have you personally grown so far, Jared? What have you learned about yourself as you continue to allow yourself to say yes and step into these unknown spaces? <laughs> well, well, I've learned that uh, no challenge is too big. I've learned that I'm more, way more adaptable than I ever gave myself credit for. My my skill set is much, my toolbox of skills is so much deeper than I allowed myself to access previously. Uh, our confidence tends to only let us use the basic tools that we're comfortable with using day after day, and we never get a chance to to break out. Hey, I want to give a keynote speech in front of a lot of people. That's a tough you know, thing to break out and see if you're ready for that kind of, uh, you know, situation. But it's funny, there's uh, one of the classes I teach, um, which is about uh, uh, time management. Uh, I tell people, I compare people kind of to the SR-71, uh, the Blackbird, which was the fastest aircraft uh, in the world for a long time. One of the neat things about it is when it sits on the ground, it literally uh, leaks liquids and fuels. Like it, they just drip onto the ground, which is, if I were, you know, a pilot and walking up to it, I think I'd be terrified that it's going to just blow up. But it's by design, right? It's by purpose. When it gets up to altitude, as it climbs higher to its maximum altitude and it increases in speed and actually grows three to four inches, not only does it become faster, but it also uses less fuel. It works less. To go faster and so for people i compare this in an instance where there's so many times where it's easy to watch that netflix series and just kind of sit on the ground and kind of like waste resources precious resources and i didn't know i was doing that i had no clue that i was in that category until i started pushing myself and then i thought every time and uh, just like i did every time where there's a position i would text my wife i want to make sure i <laughs> Family is number one on my list, right? But I want to be sensitive. But I'd text my wife. I would, I, we would look at our goals. Do we think I can try something more? And every time we said yes, and every time I pushed myself a little bit further, I found somehow that I used less time, fewer resources, and got more accomplished. And it was weird. There's there's this uh, wonderful quote out there that just kind of floats out in the ether that says, if you want something done, give it to a busy person because they're already like in their efficiency. Mm -hmm. That's what you want is that person who's already in stride to be able to carry the baton to the next, the next level. Yes. You helped to reestablish Utah Authors Day. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, Utah Authors Day. This is, I'm so excited about Utah Authors Day. So uh, back in the 60s, the League of Utah Writers had initially worked with two different governors in Utah to have a Utah Authors Day. They really wanted to celebrate authors, all the authors in Utah, and really have things going. And for about five years, they had a Utah Authors Day. <clears throat> and the, the governors would give out pins and awards. Things were kind of fun and, and playful. And we don't know why it went away in the first place. But in recent years, with the, the growth of the author community in Utah, which is tremendous, mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many people come from out of state and say Utah's got a different vibe when it comes to writing. Uh, there's so many authors here. But they just, need, they just deserve to be recognized and not just traditionally published or independently published or people who have published only 
short stories or poetry, everybody deserved to get uh, recognized. And so last year I had reached out to the governor's office um, and we discovered this uh, because as a historian, uh, Brian Young had originally pulled together some information. I was able to dig through it and find that information. I went to the governor's office and said, look, there's precedence for the governor to sign a declaration for Utah Authors Day. And here's what we think the wording should kind of look like. And, uh, and it was really interesting. Governor Cox only signed 12 declarations last year, one of which was Utah Authors Day. He was so happy and proud to do so and, and really support all the authors in Utah. And we had picked the first Saturday in December to really uh, encourage people to go out and, and get books for the holiday season to share with others and really get to know more and really create a scenario where, in, you know, especially moving forward, that anybody who goes into the community can recognize, oh, wait, I don't just have one or two published authors around me. I probably have dozens. <laughs> and look, they're at these different venues and I can go see them and I can go talk to them and, and not be intimidated. It's really hard when you see somebody at the store it, don't get me wrong, I don't think Brandon Sanderson goes to the store anymore, but it would be really weird, <laughs> you know, seeing him at the store, being behind him at the checkout line and not talking to him, but at the same time being, I could see anybody being so intimidated, mm, this isn't the right environment to say, hey, I love your books, you know, <laughs> but this creates scenarios where you can make sure to get out there and say hi to people and get to learn about them and, and have those conversations. Mm hmm Yay for Utah Author Day in December. Thank you so much. I was thrilled that we got that back and that you were a part of that. You have an event coming up next month for your book, Lifted. Can you tell us about what Lifted is about? Yeah, so it was interesting. Uh, this coincides with me being at the busiest time when I was on five nonprofit boards, and my my second-born son was born with only two chambers in his heart. And so early on, we knew we only had a couple of choices, and we, we chose the route where we were able to get some surgeries, and it would buy him time until he could have a heart transplant. Well, we had entered that window where he would be added to the transplant list. And when you do so, you end up going to a meeting where they brief you. It's like a three-day meeting. It's kind of intense to get on the transplant list. <clears throat> and they go over the dozens of medications. And they let you know where your insurance is. If they had to, if we had to pay for these medications today, this is how much you know, the, the insurance would cover. This is how much you have to cover. And uh, just looking at it was incredibly overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Like we were like, oh my gosh, like we would, not be able to do anything but pay for medications, you know, uh, every month. It's that overwhelming. So I decided, we decided that uh, what I would do is I would do a couple of side things to augment our income a little bit. And so I drove for Lyft for three years during this time. He was on the transplant list. And uh, when I was driving Lyft, it was the most interesting and unique experiences I've ever had, ever. <laughs> and probably in my life. I've talked to lots of people. At, at Comic-Con, 150,000 people show up and they're brief conversations. But in Lyft, when they're driving with you, they're kind of like, um, they're kind of hostage, right? They can't go anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> they can decide not to talk to you, which is fine. But 90% uh, but of the time they would talk to you. So this book is based on some of the most fascinating adventures that I had when I was driving Lyft. I love that so much because <laughs> I can only imagine like all the things that you heard and different personalities and backgrounds and experiences, things you've learned from those drives. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Surprising little, little pieces. I didn't know in the middle of Salt Lake, there's a, a, a whole neighborhood of like little tiny houses. They're just super tiny. One person, one little room. They're just like the tiny houses you see. There's a whole neighborhood in downtown Salt Lake. Nobody would know it's there. <laughs> like <laughs> neat things like that. You just fascinating. Have you noticed, Jared, as you are like, for instance, going with Lyft, but the different spaces that you've been, how it sparked creativity and inspiration in your life as well? 
Yeah, absolutely. Every everything, of course, lends to creativity. It gives you some inspiration. If anything, if somebody drove Lyft, I promise you, if you're looking for unique names, you're gonna 100% find them, <laughs> and, and then go, wait a minute, that's a real name. I never would have thought. You know, it's just fascinating pieces, or getting to ask people fascinating pieces of culture that you end up using, you know, in your stories. Finding out in New Zealand that uh, Cheetos are banned. You cannot get Cheetos in New Zealand, uh, but people come here and they take cases of Cheetos and they ship them home as a little bit of contraband. <laughs> Just, you know, these kind of interesting, like, little pieces I never would have thought of. I would have never considered, even in my own writing, some piece of fiction because it seems outlandish. But it's true. It's real. You know, and the more... The more you start to experience the world, the more you get to ask people. My favorite part about driving Lyft is when I got to drive experts. I drove an astronomer uh, from the Salt Lake City Airport up to Logan. So when there's a little bit of a drive, you get to ask all sorts of questions about astronomy. But I get to ask an expert. And first of all, I didn't have to pay for it. They were literally <laughs> paying me. But even as I did all of my other projects, even when I did uh, security for Real Salt Lake or or different jobs or different boards that I would take on, each one would have such unique flavor of experience that not only was it giving me this experience to apply elsewhere, but the creativity was just so rich. Uh, it's actually kind of tough because I kind of feel like I've been mining for ideas for so long that now I have like these big carts of gems and it's now harder <laughs> to choose which one to go with at this, you know, moving forward. You have like the filing cabinet of all your pretty ideas and files of like, oh, I want to just, I'm sorry, I'll come back to you later. I'm, I'm yeah. coming. <laughs> exactly. And I'm like, wait a minute, I forgot about this one. This is the one I want to, not yet. Okay. <laughs> Where will your event be held? So uh, so the book launch will be held. Uh, there's going to be one in American Fork, Utah. Uh, that's going to be on uh, um, September 27th at seven o'clock and that's at the library. Uh, and the second one's gonna happen up in Salt Lake uh, at the Legendarium bookstore, which I'm really excited about. Tremendous uh, brand new bookstore in Salt Lake. And that's on the 29th at seven o'clock as well. Perfect, we'll put the links down for those who would like to find where Jared's signings are. We're gonna turn it to the inner child question segment. Are you ready, Jared? I'm ready. All right, first question. When you were a teenager, what were the things that you liked to collect? What did I like to collect as a teenager? Oh, man. That is, uh, okay. So and it's hard because there's different, different years of the teenage year I'd collect different things. But I, I will tell you, like, I was super passionate because back in the day, it wasn't uh, as easy to get music. So what I would do is I love to collect songs by listening to the radio. And when it's going to come on, I would record it on my tape so I could put together mixtapes. So I had like a big collection of just like singles and songs uh, that I was able to then turn around and make mixtapes tapes and send to friends and stuff. I love that. So did you have like a shoebox with all your mixtapes? I did. I had, I had, uh, I had probably like three or four shoeboxes uh, of, of tapes. Yes. Did you have a favorite song or a favorite album that you like to listen to most? Yeah. Uh, so <clears throat> my good friend, Roger Whiting introduced me to this group, uh, Depeche Mode. And I don't know, like I just fell in love with them as soon as I started listening to them. And uh, there was one song in particular, Enjoy the Silence, uh, mm -hmm. which was which was so good. And the music video that they had for it, which I used to stay up and because we didn't, I didn't have cable TV. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> so there were only certain times they would play it on regular TV. So I'd stay up until like one o'clock in the morning on the weekends so I could watch the music video of this. And it was just so artistic at the same time that went along with the music that I, like that became kind of like ingrained in me so much. So now I'll, if you were to ask any of my kids, like what my favorite song is, they will say that without hesitation. They're like, every time this comes on because it's on my, you know, my playlist, 
every time it comes on, Dad says, I used to stay up until, you know, one o'clock in the morning to watch this video. So, like, my kids know, everybody knows, Enjoy the Silence uh, by Depeche Mode. Mm -hmm. There was something really exciting, I think, though, Jared, like, when they had certain shows only at a certain time. I remember like I did not plan anything on my schedule. If I really wanted to see that show, there was like a bag of Cheetos and some soda and just like presents with that show or band or song or whatever. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, well, it was tough in my house. Uh, so I had uh, four sisters and two brothers, you know, growing up and we had one TV in the main area. I know it's hard for people to imagine these days, but one TV and <laughs> To everybody's shock, I'm sure, none of us like the same shows. And, of course, there would be crossovers. So we would be – there would be a little um, little creativity on how to get that so I could watch my show well, when it came up. Was there some bartering there, Jared, that happened in your home? <laughs> sometimes. I think sometimes there was bartering. I think there was, a, there was more uh, a trickery uh, of each other. Hey, I, you know, mom was calling you in the other room. Oh, okay. <laughs> Go in there. And like, she's like, I don't need anything. I come back. The, the show's already changed. You know, mom, they changed the channel. No, if it's already on the TV, that's the show. I'm like, you got, you're kidding me. <laughs> that's... Oh, man. Yeah, a lot of scooting on the floor to hurry and get the remote before. I 100%. Know. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> What was, when you were a kid, one of your favorite art forms? Yeah. Um, so literary arts was my favorite art form. I mean, second would be Legos. But my, my, my <laughs> what happened was in, in fourth grade, when uh, I was behind, I was struggling in life. Uh, I had made it to the fourth grade kind of by faking it. I really didn't... Uh, have great reading skills or writing skills. And I was really struggling. And at this time, the Apple IIe had just been introduced to schools. So this was a brand new thing schools had never had before. And my fourth grade teacher uh, also took a lot of time to work with me. She <laughs> let my mom know, hey, by the way, your son needs extra work. So I got extra work all the way around. But um, when I went into the, the computer lab and I started typing stories that people could read, which was, you know, miraculous for me. Yeah. Um, one, a couple of my first like stories and, and interesting things I had written out and printed, and the teachers would read and, and they would share it with other teachers, and then people would show each other. I'm like, what is this? Like, that's it was unusual for me for somebody to show something I had created to somebody else in a positive light, but more like, oh, here's an interesting drawing by Jared. Uh, no, this is like this is interesting, like. Where did you come up with this? Like, where did you hear this story from? Uh, and I, I recognized early something clicked in my brain that said I loved being able to help, like, both inspire and and cause people to get a little bit emotional over over writing. So that was mm. <clears throat> that's how I primarily expressed myself. Anybody who I who I dated, all my friends, they all have dozens of stories that are probably you know, been disintegrated because they were on paper back in the day. But like I wrote so much uh, during my teenage years, it was crazy. Did you write in notebooks or did you have binders or how did you put that together? Yeah. So there would be, uh, there would be the, the college ruled notebooks that I would write <laughs> stories out. And then uh, if I was giving somebody, of course I'd tear those suckers out to, to hand them. So I have a lot of, like I had a lot of empty notebooks because I'd write a bunch and then tear them out. Um, but yeah, a, a lot of that kind of writing. But also, um, as as I got older, we got more sophisticated computer that allowed me to do some of that writing on the computer at home as well. Mm -hmm. We have a comment coming in for you, Jared. <laughs> Pesh Mode is so great, Jennifer. Yeah. Says. Welcome, Jennifer. Thank you for being here. Yeah, Depeche Mode. What a great group. Erasure comes like super close uh, second in that category. I love those groups. Mm -hmm. Third question for you, Jared. What is the oddest food combo that you've liked and tried or you've just tried? Mm. This, is a, this is a good question. Well, I think, well, 
I mean, it, it's odd to me. It's not odd to other people. <laughs> uh, just a, actually a couple of weekends ago, I had a good friend who who moved to the U.S. from Brazil. And I asked him to make us a, a genuine Brazilian dish uh, to eat. And it's called fujuada. And, uh, and it has a very unique set of things inside of it. So he made the American version, but it's funny that he had made it for, for this occasion. I'd actually had it out of a food truck, but that was unique. So the things that are in it, man, I don't know if I want to describe it, but it tasted really good. I was super shocked and surprised. <laughs> uh, it's one of those dishes where it was so popular, people wanted to make it. And so they would use whatever was available to them. Uh, which tended to include parts of animals that aren't typically, you know, eaten or consumed or looked uh, didn't cost very much, I should say. <laughs> okay, we got the visual. Just blend yeah. in. <laughs> <laughs> it was. It wasn't. You're not far off from that, but it's. It was. It's crazy because it was really good. I was absolutely shocked. Are you a visual eater, Jared, or are you good at just like not overthinking and just diving into food? So uh, that's changed over over the years, right? Like I'm more like I can dive into it. This is what I this is what I tell my wife when she makes something new. I said, let let me try it first to see if I like it, and then tell me what's in it. Because if you tell <laughs> me what's in it, I'm gonna overthink it. And I'm going to be like, that stuff doesn't work together. Um, I think I'm done. You know, before I'm even started, give it a chance. I really, really like that. And I think I'm going to start doing that too, because it makes me think of just life in general. Like if people tell you oftentimes what's going to happen, then, you know, we get more of that stress or that panic response rather than just jumping in and seeing, I wonder what kind of experience I'm going to have. Exactly. Amazing. I love that. Okay. That may change my whole view on food <laughs> entirely, Jared. <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. Before we end today, what advice can you give our listeners and viewers on living a, an abundantly creative life? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's the one piece of advice I could really give that I think is important is that life is way too short to be upset or to hold grudges. Life is way too short not to get along with everybody around you, regardless of their uh, point of view or opinion. If you really want to be immersed in the creativity, it's really getting to understand and know. Just gain a sense of curiosity and and let go of the, the, the grudges and the hate. Thank you so much for being here with us today, Jared. Where can they find you if they have any questions about your upcoming book or any questions after our chat today? Yeah, great question. So you can get me at jaredquan.com. I try to make it easy. I'm also on LinkedIn that way. I'm on Instagram, uh, Twitter, uh, Facebook, all the same direction that way. Uh, also, you'll be able to find it uh, on the Legendarium's website as well as the American Fork website. And that's going to be uh, listing that as well. Thank you, Jared, for all you do in supporting the Utah arts community. We're so grateful for the work that you're doing. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me. I'm, before I go, I got to give one quick shout out to, to literally everybody I've ever worked with. I mean, I'm here having these because of my effect on the community, but I yeah. couldn't do it alone. Teams and scores of people made everything accomplished and I am so grateful for every single person who has had the opportunity to help out and that I've been able to work with. Absolutely. Absolutely. We all lift each other up as the domino effect that we were talking before the show that just helping lead. We're always a beginner and we can help each other as we go and learn together. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for those who are watching us on the live and will be listening on the replay Remember, as you go about the rest of your week to find the things that are working within your life. And remember, you are the hero of your own story. What are you going to create next? Have a great rest of your week, and we will see you right here at 12 o'clock p.m. Mountain Standard Time 
next Monday. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Jared. Thank you.